Good morning. Thank you for coming on time. We are into our second day of ISA Arenten conference in Warsaw. We are thr thrilled to see new faces today. Um, uh, to name one, we have a professor from New York. Hello, Nancy. Hello. Nice to see you. And uh, we have an exciting day ahead. Um, we will start with two keynote addresses. Uh, the first one will be delivered by our colleagues from the University of Pennsylvania, um, Professor Mark Brennan, a professor at UNESCO chair uh, in uh, US, and uh, his colleague, Jamison Malcolm. And uh, after their presentation, we'll invite our dear guest, Professor Taiwo Afalabi from University of Regina, who is hiding at the back, but I hope he will join us in 20 minutes when this presentation <laughs> comes to its end. So thank you all for coming, and I think we're ready to start. So dear professors, the floor is yours. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you again, Anna. Um, pleasure to see everyone, and, um, and thank all of you for a wonderful evening last night, too. Um, what we had hoped to talk about today was some work that uh, um, the series of us that work with UNESCO have done uh, around youth voice and youth policy, and uh, it's work that we've engaged with Anna and others on. Um, so I thought I would just give you a bit of a background on it and, uh, and then hand it over to Jameson to show some examples and other things. So um, we'll get to it. There's been a major push within the UN system and within UNESCO to, to substantially engage youth. And part of that is it's just because of the numbers of youth globally. And I thought I would just give a, a quick background on this. Um, so um, if you talk to the, the sociologists, the demographers, others, uh, they'll talk about the youth bulge, uh, which is just this massive demographic shift we've been having. Oh, sorry. Um, so a third of the planet's under 25, um, about half um, or thirds under 15, about half under, under 25. Uh, certain parts of the world, the numbers are incredibly high. Other parts that I'll show you in a second uh, are lower, but still the numbers are substantial when you think about this in, in terms of scale. So Poland, Ukraine, you can see the numbers. 30% of the population, 26%. Um, this group has been historically very important when you think about social change, uh, issues of equity, other things. They've, they've traditionally been the ones at the forefront of, of marches, of program change, of equity change of revolutions of everything. And the uh, interesting thing about it, this, as, as many demographic shifts we see uh, come and go, uh, this is a much more sustained one. And it's going to continue for quite a long time as, as we look into it. So, um, and, and by the way, we talk about uh, youth as 15 to 25 year olds. There's, there's other definitions and we, we could certainly talk about those, but that's sort of the big picture. Um, so is, is there anyone here under 25? Oh, they've all left us already. They went off to better things. That's it. <laughs> Mentally. Yeah. I'm, I'm going on 25 for the fourth time. So it's, uh, yeah. So just to give you a scope for this, at the end of the meeting today, there's going to be 300,000 more of them born. And for those of us over 25, we will be rotated out gradually. Um, there'll be a few less of us. Um, so you can see just the... the the trend and the growth here and why it's important. And this is part of the reason why uh, UNESCO, the UN system, others, uh, a lot of NGOs have been really focused on this group. One is them being agents of change, but also at the same time them being um, the population to work with, just in terms of numbers. So to, just to put it quickly into a, a more visual uh, presentation, um, this is the average age of the population for Europe. You can see, it's, for the most part, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an older continent. Um, as we get into North America, same thing. Oh, sorry. Sorry. So you can see how Europe looks, North America. But then as we start getting into the developing world, uh, the numbers start getting smaller. So as you look at South America, uh, much more along in that line of coming closer to youth. The, the Caribbean and that area. As we get into Asia, with the exception of China and, and, and Australia, very young region. 
The Middle East, incredibly young. People often don't think of the Middle East as being a young region of the world. It's incredibly young. Um, so the last one I'll show you. What do you what, any idea what you think Africa looks like? entire continent of young people. Uh, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing in the context of this. And this is part of the reason why, um, why many of the, the, the international agencies are looking at this as a way to engage youth, both at home but also uh, globally. And there's a couple reasons for this, and we'll, we'll get into some of them here. Um, these are some of, the, just some of the images from, from my early life and some of the history of Poland. Um, you can see young people it went ahead on me without doing anything. Um, so these are the, the, the ages there where we think of images of people who have made change happen as, as young people. Um, and I still like the idea of don't trust anyone over 30, even though I'm, <laughs> I'm going at 30 for the second time. Um, but you know, there's been people who replaced these folks. Um, and that's, that's what I think is a really important thing. I think that's part of the reason why we have to have their voice included. We have to have their ideas included. Um, these are some more recent pictures of people that have picked up the, the baton from, from previous generations. And this one I like too. This is just from, this is from America. Um, you know, I grew up seeing all these massive marches in Washington to protest everything under the sun. And, uh, this is one that always impressed me. This was a few years ago when they were promoting gun violence in schools. And uh, it's the single biggest march ever in Washington, and the average age of the population was 16, uh, which I thought was pretty cool. So, um, All right. Um, something here. So one of the things we've, we've developed in, in partnership with UNESCO um, and with the UN Youth Office and others uh, has been a way to ensure youth voice. And this started off honestly, as a way to, uh, to make sure we got better information. Um, if we're looking at issues of you know, drug use, sexual behavior, all sorts of things, um, you know, a teenager is probably not going to be very open and honest with me. Uh, they're going to be very open and honest with their friends. So the idea is that young people could get better information. But that is part of it, but it quickly grew into something much different. Um, it became a program that actually where it gives youth agency, it gives them control over different things. Um, a lot of great outcomes. So, let me just give you some of the stuff here. But what we did basically, uh, you know, we took one of those incredibly boring uh, research methods courses you'd have to take at university, and we sat with young people and said, "Put this into understandable language and make this tolerable." Um, so, what it gave them is a is a is a brief crash course into doing research. Um, and what it does, again, it allows us to get better data, allows them to get better data, but it allows them to tell us what the reality of situations are. Um, very often, we think we know what we're talking about from our offices, um, or what we should be talking about. But it's actually young people on the ground that are much more in tune with the, the actual problems, the nuances of the problems, and, and, and all these sort of things. The other thing this, this program does is they share their research findings and recommendations in innovative ways. So instead of the, the boring journal articles that I write every day that no one else reads but me, um, they go out and make YouTube videos. They do infographics they share on social media. They do creative ways of communicating. And uh, it just helps to ensure that, that youth voice is, is heard and not ignored. One of the really surprising things we found is with, with senior policymakers at, at many levels, um, they take it very seriously. Having that little bit of information and data behind them uh, allows youth to actually be heard instead of just being dismissed as not knowing what the real world is and, and all this. So. I'll hand over to Jameson here in a second. I just wanted to show you some of the things that come out of this. Um, we've done a lot of research around how well the program works and all these sort of things. Um, and, and again, as the program I mentioned yesterday, all these things we do for UNESCO, they're, they're free, they're publicly accessible. There's, if you're interested, please talk to me. Um, we noticed that we hadn't thought about this, but we noticed uh, there was an increase in empathy. And really what it was was young people who were doing research, but it wasn't tied to a school assignment or something that they were to be graded on or whatever else. And they started understanding that you're, you're telling other people's stories. They started realizing that the art and craft of research. Um, and that's what it comes down to. It's us telling other people's stories. Also leads to increased civic engagement, uh, confidence, all sorts of things. Critical thinking skills uh, dramatically increased. Um, as, as Jameson will talk with one of the examples we had here, uh, you know, 
we created all these, these small research fanatics. Um, all of a sudden, they were coming back to us the next day saying, oh, I wish I sampled differently. I wish I did the surveys at a different time. And again, developing a, a passion for critical thinking and doing these sort of things. Uh, we also see direct correlations from doing the research to being civically engaged and active in their communities. Um, and this last one I, I think is really important. And this maybe goes back to that slide earlier of young people facilitating social change. Um, I think a lot of us, as we get older, we think the world is more set than it is. Um, and, and their realization by doing research and other things is that the world is much more malleable. It's much more, uh, we can facilitate change and make change happen. So that's just a bit of background on there. I'll hand over to Jameson. He's been doing all sorts of work in this area. And, and he can tell a much better story than I will. So. Well, uh, I received permission ahead of time from Anna that I could stand up and uh, walk around a bit, but I have my boundaries, the pillars, so if I get it outside of the pillars, please yell at me and I'll get back in my boundary. Um, so first of all, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to present some of the case studies that we've, uh, uh, that we've developed over the years from youth as researchers, and thank you so much, Anna, for this incredible conference. Um, really, it's been a privilege for me uh, to be able to be involved in this work because I think, I believe it's very, very important to create opportunities for youth voice and empowerment for young people who are going to be the ones who are changing the world, not only in the future, but also today. And so very briefly, I'll go through uh, the curriculum, the Youth as Researchers curriculum, describe it for you, and then I'll explain a case study and also talk about uh, the future directions that we're going with this research. So. Youth as Researchers is an example of Youth Participatory Action Research, or YPAR. And YPAR uh, always comes with um, community engagement with young people uh, that includes action. Uh, and so it, it can be quite empowering for people within their communities. Um, as Mark mentioned, it was originally developed at the UNESCO Child and Family Resource uh, Research Center uh, in Galway uh, from Pat Dolan, Mark Brennan, and others. And um, Essentially, the, the manual is uh, a graduate level mixed methods research course distilled down for young people. And there's even rumors that graduate students use this manual as a cheat sheet for their own studies. I'm not saying I've done that, but there are rumors. Uh, the manual and the workbook consist of the following elements. So deciding on a research topic, finding out about that topic, uh, planning for change, writing research questions, design, ethics, reporting findings, and dissemination. And um, within the context of empowerment and contribution, uh, the dissemination piece can sometimes be the most powerful for the young participants. Delivery steps for youth as researchers are identifying a target audience, um, identifying a sponsoring organization. And so the way that this has worked the best uh, in the past is embedding this curriculum in an already existing youth development organization. And in the case study that I'm about to describe, that organization was called Saturday Academy. And it takes place on Saturdays weekly uh, in a very economically depressed and marginalized community in North Philadelphia, where I used to live. Uh, recruiting participants from that community, conducting trainings, disseminating research findings, and then also there's uh, a youth-led evaluation tool to go along with the curriculum. Uh, so this, this is a map of Philadelphia. And if I can, I'd like to ask for a bit of crowd participation just for a moment. Uh, this is a crime map of the city of Philadelphia. And in particular, this represents gun crime in Philly. Uh, and what I'd like to point out here are there, some, there are some very expected uh, areas and then some unexpected areas on this map. So this area right here, right above Mark's head, that's uh, Center City, Philadelphia. That's the economic center. There's restaurants and cafes, high-rise buildings, and um, it's quite a well-off area. Uh, and then as you travel south from Center City, that's um, neighborhoods in South Philadelphia that, again, are very well off. As you travel up the Delaware River to the east, you can see uh, these are areas where there's businesses, casinos, again, restaurants, very well off. Um, but this area in West Philadelphia and this area in North Philadelphia has extremely high rates of gun crime, other violent crimes, also many other negative community indicators. This is the neighborhood right here where Saturday Academy takes place. 
And uh, I used to run this program and have been involved, I really have had the privilege of being involved in this community for the last almost 20 years, uh, running a mentoring and educational enrichment program, uh, which is Saturday Academy. And this is also, that became the home uh, for youth as researchers in North Philadelphia. But there are a couple of anomalies that I'd love to get your opinion on. So this, this just means there's no data. Um, but this one here, it's surrounded by dark red, and then it gets lighter. This one, surrounded by dark red, and it gets lighter. And then here in particular, uh, it's very light, which means very low crime, and then it's surrounded by red. Would anybody like to take a guess as to what's going on block to block in these areas? And there's no right or wrong answers, it's just a brainstorm. What do you think is happening here? Nobody lives there, Nobody lives there. okay, <laughs> yeah. Police departments, okay. Or they live there. Oh, maybe people don't live there, maybe they don't sleep there or something, okay. It, mm. Mm. So gentrification, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's not totally wrong, yeah. Okay, school zones. Gated communities, okay. Uh, so it's, it's hard to tell from the map, but these are actually, these blocks are quite large areas. So actually what's going on here, this is LaSalle University in North Philadelphia. This area here, this is Temple University in North Philadelphia. And this large area right here is University City, which is where the University of Pennsylvania is, Drexel University, and the University of the Sciences. And so I only point that out to say that it's not a mystery to deal with high crime rates. The right amount of resources and people and attention and capacity and especially opportunity can help lower crime rates. But as I said, the neighborhood that we've been working in is right here, right in the, the center of North Philadelphia. There's many, many incredible things about this community and there's some really incredible people who live in this community. Uh, and, and when I talk about the kids that we work with, we never use the term at-risk youth, which I think is quite a pejorative term. Uh, the kids that I work with are survivors, they're overcomers, they're incredible, incredible young people. And I think you'll agree with me here in a few minutes. So as a researcher, I went into the community with my own biases and assumptions about what they would want to study. And I thought maybe it's education or schooling, maybe it's drug use, maybe it's crime. But their topic was so insightful and based on their lived experiences. They wanted to, the number one thing they wanted to study was police brutality in their neighborhood and also police and community interactions in their neighborhood. And I just thought it was a fantastic topic and, and so timely, uh, especially in the context of the United States and race relations and racism. And so uh, we actually got permission from uh, the police commissioner of Philadelphia, uh, the, the top policeman in the city, to be able to interview police officers. These police officers work in the neighborhoods where these young people live. They also chose to do street surveys of community members' perceptions of policing in their neighborhood. And so uh, through convenience sampling and snowball sampling, they collected many surveys uh, from the community. Uh, we also had film professionals in Philadelphia mentor the young people in writing, directing, starring, and filming and editing their own documentary to be able to present to their community and to stakeholders. And uh, if you'd like, Mark, maybe you can slide over just a bit. We'll watch, we'll watch the five-minute film here, but if you would like access to it later, you can scan this QR code right here. I'll leave it up there just for uh, 10 seconds if, if anybody wants to scan that. And now we'll watch the video, uh, which I think is really quite good. And at this point, I'm going to step outside of my boundary so that you can see. I love my community. They have multiple things to do here, and it's just I feel like family.
I felt unsafe around police. I felt scared that they might do something to me. At first, I felt misunderstood about them. I felt like they didn't have no heart for people. If police brutality was in your top three, raise your hand. Come on. We got one, two, three. Yeah. 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 CC, take one, mark. You talked as a group. Chose our research topic. Wrote surveys. Surveyed the police and the community. Analyze our data. Presenting our data to you. 74% of the community doesn't feel threatened when they see a police officer. 100% of police officers surveyed says that they are not afraid in our community. We asked the community who is responsible for creating negative stereotypes. The community is almost evenly split on this question. 78% of the community says they have not experienced police brutality. 88% of the police survey feels alert in the neighborhoods where they work. All police officers surveyed feel that youth interviews are productive. Our data shows that police officers are not afraid of the community. Our data also shows that our community is not afraid of the police. The next step is to keep this conversation going. And we can do this by letting the youth in our community and the police communicate more often. No research about us! Without, without us! No research about us! Without, without us! us. No research about us! Without, without us! us. Uh, so, Again, this, fil uh, this film that you just watched was written, directed, uh, edited by young people. And when I say young people, these folks were uh, 13 to 16 years old. Uh, and so I think you'll agree with me that there are some pretty incredible young folks. Um, I, I do also want to acknowledge, as we're running up on our time here, that in this context, you saw a, a picture of police officers and young people smiling and hugging. And I, I just want to say that in that context, that was safe for them. In a different context, they may not be as safe, and so I just wanted to say that. Um, as, as we close out here, there are uh, lots of outcomes that we looked at. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about that, uh, we can do that after the presentation. I'd be happy to continue talking about that. Um, and there's several quotes that we look at as indicators of positive youth development outcomes. Um, but this is the thing that I'm really excited about today. Um, and so starting this Monday, uh, in a partnership with Penn State University, this university, and, and three other universities across Europe, uh, we're going to begin youth as researchers with Ukrainian refugee youth. And uh, I just want to say a, a huge thank you to Anna and Eva, who are helping with uh, kicking this program off here in Warsaw on Monday. And we're looking at these various uh, indicators, but I'm out of time, and I don't want to take away from Taiwo's time at all. So thank you very much, and uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation with you all.